Hi everyone, my name is Matt Williams. I am the Access Fellow at Jesus College at the University of Oxford and I'm a political scientist so I'm really interested in politics, power, law and the question I've got for you today is where does law come from? There are a lot of laws. In fact, one of the hallmarks of a civilization is said to be that we live under the rule of law. And in some countries, it might be illegal to walk down the street naked, such as in the United Kingdom. In other countries, it might be illegal to wear certain types of clothes or not wear certain types of clothes. In some places, you can legally buy drugs and in other countries you can't. So the question is, well, where do these all come from? Where do laws come from? Why are they so different from different parts of the world? And this question entails a lot of history, a lot of economics, politics, economics. I've said economics already. I'll say it again. Never mind. Anyway, I'm going to go through my slides. So here we go. Um, so why don't we start by just having a little think about the state, because laws are typically made and enforced by states. States are these sort of very big organizations usually coterminous with a set portion of geography, so a bit of land. So the United Kingdom state covers the ge geographic territory of that, those islands that we call the United Kingdom. But where can you see evidence of the state around you? Why don't you just take a quick look around you and think if you can see any laws or any sort of evidence of the state in your immediate vicinity? Well, you could potentially see the state in almost everything, right? So I've given you a photograph of one of my uh, plug sockets there. It's not particularly well filled in around the edges, as you can see, so I apologize for that, but it's a plug socket nonetheless. Now, what evidence of the state is there in this? Well, for a start, uh, it's three pin, and that's because of state regulation. Uh, it's got safety device in the switch. It's got the red color, which is demanded by regulation as well. Even if you look into the paint and the lead content of the paint around the plug, that's also regulated by the state. So even in something as modest as your plug sockets, you can see evidence of state authority and law because it is really pretty much everywhere. You can potentially hear the state. So every time you hear a siren pass by your window, that's evidence of state power and state services around you. You can smell it in your gas. If you've got a gas cooker, the smell of gas is pumped into it by state regulation because gas is actually naturally odorless. You can sometimes feel the state. If you walk along a pavement, there's little bobbles next to where you're supposed to cross, which is to help people with uh, sight impairments to know when to cross. So the state is kind of everywhere. It, it infiltrates so many aspects of our lives. And it begs the question as to well, where did it all come from? Now, before we talk about where it comes from, we kind of need to work out what it even is. How would you define a state and a state under law? It's quite complicated. Um, so one, uh, one theory uh, brought up by a German sociologist called Max Weber is that the state is the monopoly on the legitimate use of force in a given territory, the monopoly on a given, uh, on legitimate force, okay? So in other words, the state is a fundamentally violent entity. It's here to control a particular territory. It's like the, the biggest, baddest bully in the, in the playground, but its use of force is legitimate, meaning that we as citizens accept its right to keep us in check, if you like, okay? Another theory, is that actually it's a little bit more of a contract between citizens and the state that we unconsciously or tacitly agree some sort of deal with the powers that be in the state in order to maintain our protection and for our best interests. So that social contract is very common theory to describe what states are and where they may have come from. A perhaps slightly more cynical rendering, although one I really like because it's so cynical, um, it comes from Charles Tilley, and he suggests that states are basically protection rackets with legitimacy. So for Charles Tilley, the, the, the state, the government, the rules are very little different to a mafia gang. <laughs> they shake you down for your money. Uh, they promise to provide you protection. Uh, if you don't do what they say, they beat you up or imprison you and, and all the rest of it. As I say, slightly cynical, but there's something to it. You know, conceptually, when you've got a, a turf, a bit of territory governed by a very powerful gang, you call that, you know, organized crime or a mafia. But then when you talk about it on the scale of a country, you talk, call it government. <laughs> but maybe it's conceptually identical. Anyway, I'll leave that up to you. So how are their states? Where did they, <coughs> excuse me, where did these things come from? Well, there are a couple of prominent theories. Perhaps first and most importantly is that states developed in order to pool security. In other words, human beings in their earlier stages used to live in communities. We're a social species. We can't survive on our own. 
in infancy. So we need the protection of those around us. And initially that would have been immediate family and maybe extended family in what would become, if you like, tribes in, in a sort of anthropological sense. But then ultimately, human beings started to settle. They stopped hunting and gathering. They started to settle in communities and farm produce and therefore had the capacity to grow their population centers quite rapidly, despite the fact that they were fixed in a certain geographic area. Now, as these population centers grew, they would start to come into conflict with other population centers who might get jealous of the relative resources. A really classic example of this is Jerusalem. Jerusalem has been fought over for thousands of years, and it's sometimes a bit of a mystery as to why. Now, of course, these days the fights are over religion and ideology, but initially Jerusalem was fought over because it's the best source of water in that part of the desert. So really good resource. Everyone wants it because everyone needs it to survive, and so people fight over it. And in order to make that fighting more efficient and more effective, it's a good idea to band together and to form these units that become states. So in the words of, um, of Charles Tilly again, wars make states and states make wars. It's a feedback loop that they, the practice of fighting with your neighbours over resources is what creates the bureaucracy that we then describe as a state and that then latterly creates all of the laws that we are forced to follow. Thomas Hobbes also famously said that without a state you're in a state of nature and that that is brutal and, and short-lived. It's incredibly dangerous that you know it would be anarchy and anarchy is so dangerous that we would we would almost always automatically prefer living under a state. Now that still begs the question as to why certain places developed earlier than others. Now be careful with the, with the verb developed, I'm not sort of saying this in a proving sense, but just why were certain state forms earlier uh, noticed in some parts of the world than others? Now Venice and England are often cited as amongst the first places where well-established rules of law developed. And this is the Bridge of Sighs in Venice and this is the equivalent of it in the city of Oxford, where I, where I work. Um, now, Venice and England not only had to make sure that they secured themselves from ferocious neighbours, and therefore had that, that uh, need to, to develop a state, they were also both maritime trading powers. And if you want to do lots of complex trades, you need a rule of law so that people will trust the trading environment. If anyone could do a deal with you, but then could renege on that deal, then trade disappears. It all becomes just a personal uh, set of agreements. But a rule of law means that you can trust those trades. You can have credibility and confidence in them. So part of the story is that Venice and England developed their state apparatus earlier than other parts of, say, Europe and the rest of the world, not only because of the security necessity, but beyond that to start trading with the rest of the world as well. And that links into geopolitics. And another interesting component is population density. That has a big uh, explanatory power when it comes to working out different types of states. Why, for example, was Africa somewhat lesser developed when it came to state infrastructure than Europe? Well, the answer, broadly speaking, is population density. In Africa, there was less of a need to densely populate around certain resources because Africa is capable of sustaining much less densely populated communities. Whereas in Europe, in order to survive the, the relatively harsh environment, populations had to more densely pack around each other. You can see this in, uh, in a sort of microcosmic form in a place like America. So why, for example, are states like Virginia, this one, and Massachusetts, represented here by one of its most famous sons, John Adams, so different in their political outlooks? Massachusetts, quite progressive, liberal, socially oriented state. Virginia, somewhat more conservative, Republican state, although those things are changing these days. Anyway, why were they so different? Well, the story is that you know Massachusetts is a really difficult place to live in. If there's no state there, it's difficult to survive. So you're kind of in your state of nature. The old Thanksgiving celebrations that the Americans enjoy is a celebration of the fact that the Americans were going to die and the Native Americans gave them some food to keep them alive because that part of New England is incredibly difficult to survive in. It's a harsh environment in short. And so that encourages people to live in close proximity, to share resources, to work together to solve common problems. And the story goes that that's what made not only Massachusetts grow much faster population density, but also have a greater sense of shared and collective uh, fate that they have to work together in order to survive. In Virginia, however, there's this fabulous river tributary network, very, very lush, very verdant, very easy to survive, in very sparsely populated communities, such that if the state was ever to come into your 
into your homestead, your business, it would be to take something from you. They would take some tax, they would take some property, they would do something nefarious. And so the, the, the attitude to the state is far more negative in Virginia because you simply don't need it to survive to the same extent as you would have done in Massachusetts. And hence, quite a radical difference in mindset to a certain extent, a function of the difference in geopolitics. And then, of course, there's culture. Now, culture, I would argue, is sort of overlaid on top of these security, economic, and geopolitical matters. The culture is the sort of the icing on the cake, if you like. But culture is still very important. There are various different sort of attitudes around the world, some of them informed by religion, some of them informed by history, that affect how different cultures view the state, its legitimacy, and how laws ought to be created. There are various sort of forms that you'll find uh, in various different places. So things like plutocracy, which is the rule of the wealthy in some parts of the world. It's considered that the wealthy are not so rich because they're better people and therefore they deserve the power. There's uh, theocracy, which is ruled by religious uh, leaders, of which the UK is technically an example because the Queen is the head of the Church of England and we have bishops in the House of Lords, so Britain is technically a theocracy. There is gerontocracy, which is the rule of the elderly, uh, which in some societies are given greater respect than in others. And there's cacistocracy, which is the rule of the worst, which is an intriguing one. I just threw that in there just out of interest, but you might think that in some countries we are ruled by the worst of us. I'll leave that to you. <laughs> but just to give you a concrete comparison, what about North and South Korea? Very different culturally, very different states, very different state forms. And yet they have very similar geopolitics, very similar histories. They have a shared history until the 1950s. So how have they diverged so much? So here's North Korea, here's South Korea in Seoul. Uh, and part of the story is that there's the Juche uh, ideology of North Korea, which is a sort of pseudo communist, but actually mostly fascist ideology that justifies um, the, the way that that government is organized. Anyway, it's a big, big old topic. So we've, we've absolutely romped through all sorts of important themes, but why don't we bring it closer to home and let you think about a particularly open question. Do you think that you live in a strong state? And what does it mean for a state to be strong? We've been trying to work out, well, what are laws and where do they come from? But how can we evaluate the relative strength of states? So do you think you are living in a strong state? You might want to think not only about the UK, but also Wales separately. Um, are we better off without a state and this protection racket that sort of shakes us down and hustles us for our money every now and then? Some anarchists would say we are, but others would think, oh, that sounds terrifying. <laughs> We'd be in a state of nature again. And what's the future of the state Generally speaking, are we heading towards the disintegration of nation states and a move to more market oriented states and, and global states? Well, it seems in the era of Brexit and Trump that that might not be happening imminently, but you know, in 50, 100 years time, maybe the division of the world into geographic units won't make a great deal of sense anymore. Who knows? And I've included, just to sort of round off the conversation, a design of a union flag that would include the Welsh uh, St David's Cross, which has been uh, suggested as a sort of post-Brexit flag for the UK to try and strengthen our ties. And the reason I'm including this is that it shows how much narrative matters, how much the stories we tell ourselves about our state and our identity can make a difference to the actual strength of that state. That notion of community, of bonding, of ties does matter as well as the, the money, the economics, the security, the geopolitics, and all that other stuff. So have a think. There's plenty of themes to think about. There's lots of stuff in this story that you might want to inquire into. And if you'd like to get in touch, my email address is matthew.williams at jesus.ox.ac.uk, and I'd be happy to provide you with any further resources or ideas. Thanks so much for watching. All the best. Goodbye. Hello everyone, my name is Lewis Griffiths and I'm a third year studying ancient history and classical archaeology at the University of Oxford. I'm sure you're all aware that uh, Oxbridge runs on a collegiate based system. So I'm a, a member of St John's College, so shout out to St John's. Um, I'm making this video just to give a, a brief insight or an overview of what it's like to study ancient history at uh, the University of Oxford. Um, because, like all of you, I was a member of the, the Seren project, which was very helpful in uh, securing my place at Oxford. Uh, in terms of my background, I'm from Caerphilly in South Wales. Uh, I went to Uskol Govin Cumfrumni, and for my A-levels, I didn't do anything to do with classics, ancient history, archaeology, etc. 
I studied uh, economics, geography, uh, history, uh, and for AS level, I did uh, English literature as well. And of course, I had to do the dreaded back. Whilst this presentation is mainly about uh, my experience of classical archaeology and ancient history, I thought it would be useful to point out that you can do ancient history modules uh, as, as part of an ancient and modern history degree and also as part of a classics degree. So in your first year studying classical archaeology and ancient history, you study four papers for which you will sit exams called prelims at the end of uh, your first year. Two of your papers are core classes, so these are uh, an introduction to two key areas of ancient history. So you do aristocracy and democracy in the Greek world, 550 to 450 BC. And then on the Roman side of things, you do Republic to Empire, Rome 50 BC to AD 50. You do two further options papers, one of which must be a history paper, the other must be an archaeological paper. You may replace one of these uh, with a language paper if you wanted to. Uh, and for the archaeology paper, I went for Roman architecture, which I loved. And also for the history paper, I went for Tacitus and Tiberius, which uh, is dealing with Tacitus's treatment of the emperor Tiberius within his works. And then your second and third year structure uh, looks like this. They, they call it your finals because these are the papers which you'll sit for your final exams. So you do six papers. One of these must be uh, a core class and then you do five further options. The core classes are Rome, Italy and the Hellenistic East, 300 to 100 BC, or Imperial Culture and Society, AD 50 to 150. Now, if you really wanted to, you could do both, but that's uh, not very common. And then you do uh, your five further options, and there's an absolutely vast array of options that the, the classics faculty offers. Uh, but I chose art under the Roman Empire, cities and settlements under the empire, the Greek city in the Roman world, Republican crisis and Roman and Greek coins. And then finally, you do a museum or site report, which is a thesis. And for mine, I'm looking at uh, the funerary reliefs of uh, freed women. So these are ex-slaves and what they wanted to tell us uh, through the funerary monuments. So I'll detail a little bit about the, the teaching style, but I'll go into more depth in a moment. There are core classes, there are tutorials, and then there are classes for special subjects. So I think the, the bread and butter of the Oxford experience or Oxbridge experience are the tutorials, especially true in arts subjects such as ancient history. So you'll usually have one tutorial a week and you'll write uh, an essay of about 2,000, 2,500 words, which you submit 24 hours beforehand. Um, and then in these tutorials, you discuss with your tutor and your tutor partner um, the, the points you're making in your essay and how you're answering the question. And then that usually leads on to further discussion. Uh, some terms you might be having two tutorials in one week. So that means two essays a week. I found that this made the workload quite difficult to manage, but that's probably because I'm quite unorganised. Um, but I think what I would say about tutorials is that they are quite nerve wracking at first because you are arguing a point with someone who is perhaps the world subject in that particular area of history. But you then have some amazing discussions and the more you put into it, the more you get out of it. Another key element of the teaching style here at Oxford and studying uh, ancient history are the classes. So there are two types of classes. There are core classes and classes for special subjects. Core classes uh, usually require you to write one essay per week. Uh, there are usually about six, seven, eight students in one of these classes and two or three tutors, at least one archaeology tutor and one ancient history tutor. And then the third can be either and is often a DPhil or a PhD student. These can be held in any college. And that's something I like because you can go and have a, a quick nose around other colleges on your way to class. Uh, but then on the weeks that you're not doing an essay, you are required to make a presentation to the class of no more than 15 minutes with slides and a handout on a specific text or archaeological site. You will then be questioned by the tutors and the class. Uh, but for me, I'm not really a big fan of this, as I prefer writing an essay uh, to, to standing up in front of everyone. And the second type of classes are the classes for special subjects. Uh, these d very much vary depending on how many people are in your class. So as there are only two people doing my special subject, which is the Greek city in the 
Roman world, we have to make uh, a presentation on a gobbit every week. And a gobbit is uh, a, an historical source, uh, an extract of, of text. Uh, and then for these classes, you will also write uh, an exam answer to a gobbit, which is usually about three quarters of a page in length. And then you will do an essay every other week. Lectures are, of course, a big part of studying ancient history at Oxford. Um, but I think there are, there are two things I'd make you aware of. Firstly, that lectures are not necessarily delivered during the same term as you're studying the module. So what that means is that you might be taking or going to lectures in October for a module that you'll study in April. So it's really key to, to be on top of it and know what lectures are when, because if you've missed them and they're only in person, then you've mix, missed them. Secondly, is that the, the lectures might not be specific to your paper. So there may be uh, an ancient history tutor doing a lecture series on a particular period of Roman history. And then people studying different papers will come and, and use the bits of those lectures that are relevant to their course. Some archaeology lectures, uh, namely the coinage series, let you handle original pieces, a little bit like handling sessions. That's really cool. Uh, but thankfully, COVID has sort of kicked Oxford into, into the modern world. And now lectures are online and they're pre-recorded, so you can watch them when you want. And lectures, uh, for me, from my experience, have either been in the examination schools, which is a really beautiful building on High Street, or in the bit more plain uh, Classics uh, Centre or the Archaeology Institute. But uh, I kind of like the, the Classics Centre ones because, luckily for me, they're just across the road. So that means I can get from uh, my bedroom to the, the lecture theatre in about four minutes. Handling sessions are a really fun and exciting uh, aspect of the course at Oxford. So I would note that these really depend on the college that you go to. I'm very fortunate here at St John's that the archaeology user is uh, also the curator at the Ashmolean Museum. So this means that she can give us access to objects from the storerooms. Uh, these are optional sessions, but they're highly encouraged uh, and they would take place weekly, pre-COVID, of course, uh, and you would handle original pieces of material culture uh, up close and study them and then discuss what you think of them and what you can get from that object uh, in terms of using it as an historical source. I think this is an amazing opportunity that you just wouldn't get anywhere else. Um, and it's it's one of my favourite things about my course. So I found it quite difficult to give you an insight into what an average day is like, um, as, of course, every day is different. It, it depends on your workload, the week, uh, extracurricular activities. And of course, COVID has uh, changed this a lot. So uh, life at university is a little bit less exciting uh, socially than it usually would be. Uh, but I think it is true to say that uh, ancient history and other arts uh, subjects are less structured than the sciences. Uh, this is a good and a bad thing. So you can pretty much structure your day how you want it to look like. But then on the on the, the converse of this, it's very easy to procrastinate and get nothing done. Um, and I think another point to make is it's important to take time off and not feel guilty about not working or being busy. Working hours fluctuate massively. So some days I could be working, you know, well into the early hours of the morning. Uh, and that's probably down to not making sure that I've got the work done before before the deadline is getting near. Um, and other days, you know, I can take time off and do nothing all day. Weekends are not really the same concept as they are at school. So you don't have Saturday and Sunday uh, as your days off. Uh, your days off depend when your deadlines are. So that means uh, you might take a Wednesday off if you've handed in your essay uh, on a Monday and had the tutorial on a Tuesday, uh, you know, rather than having a Saturday off. If we briefly talk about the, the kinds of careers that a, a degree from Oxford in Ancient History can lead to, I think what I would say is that it can pretty much lead to any career that you want to go and do. Um, so I've got friends who are doing further study and they want to become uh, lecturers or tutors at universities in, in, in related subjects. I've got other friends who have uh, taken some time out. Someone else I know is becoming an accountant. Uh, but personally, I'm currently applying for jobs uh, and internships and things like that with uh, corporate law firms based in London. Um, and I would stress that even though the, the degree doesn't necessarily 
lead to a specific vocation. It's the, the skills, the analytical skills that you develop from studying at Oxford and doing ancient history in particular that are really uh, valued by employers. So I think ancient history gives you a real good option of going to study uh, what you're passionate about or what you find interesting and then also going to a career afterwards which could either be lucrative or something which is a little bit more fulfilling. Thank you very much for, for listening to what I've had to say about studying ancient history at Oxford. Um, I wish everyone the best of luck in their applications to universities, whatever subject they go and decide to, to study. I'll now hand you back over to the team and uh, they'll continue with the next steps. I do hope you enjoyed your first masterclass full of interesting ideas. Let's have a short five minute break from the screen. Stretch your legs, take a comfort break. Lobby. Come back to the lobby for your next masterclass. Avi then which will start at 2.55.